All right, and you're going to hear my audio from the presentation in just a minute. Today we're going to be talking, as you can see on the screen, about what our obligation is to animal welfare. When I was six or seven years old, I had a chicken named Isis who would ride on my back while I was sledding. My duck spinach and I could find our way home from a quarter mile away. I also hung out with a pig named Thora and a cow striped just like an organ. As many of you know, I was homeschooled, and thanks, mom and dad. <laughs> Uh, as, as you know, that sometimes means that animal friends are more easy to find than human. It was a joy to grow up on a farm surrounded by these animals and to learn who they were. The farm where I grew up was small, and as you can see by this picture, uh, this is a picture when I was maybe maybe seven or eight, uh, and this is a little orphan calf named Midnight who my family had, and our dog Risco. It was a really good dog, always getting into perfect plants. Uh, only recently have factory farms started looking less and less like the farm I grew up on and have started producing the majority of animal products. So this is our plan today. We're going to start by talking about how God designed creation. We're going to discuss how industrial farming deviates from this design in pig farming, in chicken farming, in cattle farming, and also within the fishing industry. And we're going to wonder what dietary habits can help us be good stewards, and finally, how we can delight in these habits. And then we're going to eat some really delicious food. So let's talk about first creation. In Genesis 1, it says, The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kind, trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. So let's think about this together. What com comes to mind when we think of a good creation? Yeah, harmony. Diversity, very good. I think about clean water. Um, I think about, sometimes I think about my five senses. So um, if we go through a few, maybe that looks like uh, green trees and blue skies and it smells like wheat in a field. When I was little, I used to lay down in the field and it would just smell so delicious, like wheat. And I could feel a thousand little grasshoppers on me the moment that I laid down. And I could feel the warm sunlight on my face and I could smell flowers and grass, maybe some cattle manure. Um, and I could hear birds twittering and the crunch of like leaves and grasses and things like that. So that's what a good creation can look like. It can sound like pattering rain, twittering birds, crackling grass, and it can it can feel like soft fur or sunshine on your face. Genesis one says, "So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living thing with which the water teems, and that moves about in it according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind." And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase in the earth. When I think of a good creation, I also think of one that is hospitable. And to be hospitable, I think a place needs to suit the needs of those who live there. Um, God created creation to allow creatures to interact in accordance with the instincts and desires that God designed them with and to use their bodies in the way that God ordained. So maybe for a chicken on a farm or anywhere really, that might look like using the claws that God gave them to scratch in the dirt and the wings to create dust baths to keep cool and to shelter their children. Creatures in a hospital creation are also able to interact with each other and with their environment. So zebras have enough space to evade predators, that be an interaction, kind of like the one we see on the screen with this lion and this wildebeest. Uh, wolves can live in packs, which is a desire that God has placed in their instinct, and they can still have enough to eat, um, enough prey, even when they're living so close together. And birds can migrate along the same routes as their ancestors. A hospitable habitat also offers a reasonably consistent and predictable 
Genesis 1 says, God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. A good creation is also sustainable. What has been created can be continued. Now, sustainability has become a little bit of a buzzword these days, but what it really just means is that what has been created can continue. So this depends on the recycling of energy, nutrients, and raw material. Since no matter is added or removed, recycling is crucial. There's no trash and no waste in nature. Um, oxygen in the air is exhaled by plants through photosynthesis and inhaled by animals. Animals exhale carbon dioxide, which plants inhale. That is like this incredible cycle, and it's the reason any of us are alive. A sustainable creation also has a diversity of organisms that lend to maintenance of cycles and homeostasis that we've talked about. Coyotes strip meat and return nutrients to the ground through their droppings. Squirrels plant trees when they bury nets. And elephant wallows actually deepen drinking pools in rivers so that others can drink that water from longer because it doesn't evaporate as fast. So let's think about this in terms of farming. Methods for farming animals should seek to emulate these principles outlined in creation, if we farm animals at all. As stewards, it's our responsibility to support these cycles, interactions, and flourishing. So how are we doing? Now, as you can see on the screen, I pull up the definition of a factory farm. And it's defined as 1,000 cattle, 700 dairy cows, 2,500 pigs, 125,000 broiler chickens, or 82,000 laying hens. You'll notice that there's an or at the end of that sentence, so it does not have to have all of the things. And I may have used this interchangeably already with the word CAFO, which stands for Confined Animal Feeding Operation. So we're going to use these back and forth. They basically mean big farms where animals are kept. So most animals eaten in the United States never graze on the rolling hills or rest in little red barns. Factory farms now produce upwards of 95% of animal pups. The most chickens my family of eight ever cared for was 40. So the sheer magnitude of these farms that can have 125,000 broiler chickens or 82,000 laying hens is just unimaginable to me. CAFOs can find animals for at least 45 days in a 12 month period and have no grass or other vegetation in a confining area. So those two parts of the definition come from the NRCS. And yeah, so it's important to remember that a farm can be both a family farm and a factory farm. I want us to remember the desires of these fellow creatures and the conditions our creator designed for them. So let's talk about pigs. Yes, they're so cute. Uh, pigs are mammals. Mother pigs nurse their babies and love to create nests for them out of straw, leaves, or other natural materials. Piglets are quick and curious, and they are so like faster than a rabbit. I have chased a good number of piglets in my day, and you will not catch them unless you're able to corner them. It's that ability is so crazy. They love exploring with their mothers and wrestling with their siblings, and they love rooting in soil. They're naturally omnivorous and eat plants, roots, and insects. Mother pigs have even been known to eat snakes who threaten their piglets. Because of their incredible sense of smell, pigs keep themselves clean. Even in small pens, pigs defecate as far away from their food and water as possible. Because pigs cannot sweat, they rely on mud baths to cool and protect their skin. In most pork production facilities, mothers do not have access to the nesting materials and are kept in cages where they are unable to move around enough to make nests. Sadly, due to the tight quarters and lack of cushioning nests, piglets are often accidentally crushed by their mothers. Many farms can't take the piglet's tails because cramped conditions encourage the pigs to chew on each other to relieve their stress. When the pigs are six months old, they are slaughtered. For workers at slaughterhouses and meat packing plants, conditions are often brutal. Uh, since their work requires such sharp knives and heavy machinery, injuries are very common. A 2017 report using OSHA data found, quote, two poultry and meat processing facilities reported among the largest numbers of severe injuries, defined as involving amputation, hospitalization, or loss of an eye. 
further, the poultry industry as a whole, end quote, reported more severe industries, quote, than the sawmill industry, auto, or steel. Ferocious line speeds compel some workers to wear diapers at their workstations. Ignacio de Malos, a worker at a pig processing facility, said of the work conditions, we've already gone from the line of exhaustion to the line of pain, end quote. So these pigs living in tight quarters must produce a lot of manure. I mean, as we talked about earlier, these farms contain at least 2,500 pigs. So the pig excrement from these factory farms is stored in massive ponds called manure lagoons. As you can see, these, these lagoons are massive. They are literally the size of a pond. And they're often pink in color. The open air vats allow overflow into local water sources during heavy rainstorms or other weather events. And unfortunately, pig excrement frequently contains E. coli and antibiotic resistant bacteria, which means leaky lagoons are a threat to safe drinking water. To take advantage of the nutrients in this manure, farm operators sometimes spray the waste onto fields. However, the untreated waste um, can, can become airborne and has caused some big pink farm neighbors, excuse me, to shut up their windows and stay inside. So we're going to hear a video. Uh, this is on YouTube called How Swine in North Carolina Affects Real People. And we're listening to an excerpt um, from a woman named Renee Miller who lives near one of these pig farms. My sister, she had asked me, you know, and her brother, he had asked me. He's free her, and we don't know what she might have. I have asthma, I have sinus, I have sarcoidosis, that's a bacteria, and I have a pacemaker, which is sick sinus syndrome. But, you know, mostly everybody in this neighborhood got asthma or even cancer. My neighbor there died from cancer probably just last year. My nephew down the street, he's got cancer. He's in terminal cancer, stage four. Not a smoker, not a drinker. And it's not in his lungs. It's in his lungs. But see, if you live here and saw the way they do, you don't need no pork. Well, I don't need bacon because I know where it comes from. When they die. So I really like being able to hear the perspective of someone who lives right near one of these farms and for whom swine farming is a daily part of their life, even though they're not a farmer or connected to the industry other than being a neighbor to it. So the Duke University School of Medicine has found links between exposure to the waste from these hot farms and acute blood pressure increase, impaired neurobehavioral and pulmonary function, as well as carcinogens. Because living near one of these pig farms is unpleasant and can be hazardous, they're often placed in communities where the people are unable to fight down the road away. Unable or unwilling. A study by the University of North Carolina found that these farms are disproportionately placed in black, brown, and especially indigenous communities. So next we're going to talk about chickens. Chickens sit on their eggs for 21 days before the hens hatch. Once my sister's hen Isis gave birth to yeah, maybe like 12 chicks. And it was so neat because even though their mother was this steely, like blue, gray color, um, only one of the chicks, like my, my rooster Alexander, hatched looking just like his mother. And then there were maybe three red brown ones that were so beautiful, and four white chicks, and some jet black ones. It was very cool to see all the different colors. Um, and I think most of them hatched out of green eggs. It's really cool. So when the chicks hatch out of eggs, which like I said, can be green, they can be white or brown, they immediately imprint on their mothers. And this is a bond that keeps them sick as their mothers teach them where to scratch for seeds and insects to eat. Their fathers look like predators much larger than themselves to defend their young. In the wild, chickens can live up to seven years, and those cats as pets can live up to 12 years, with life span similar to a dog's. In the egg industry, chicks never get to meet their parents. Since male chicks cannot lay eggs, they're killed the day they hatch. 
This is because a lot of the chickens that are bred for eggs have a very different body type than those that are bred to produce um, meat, so they're not economically viable. Hay fields maximize efficiency by breeding animals to grow more quickly than ever before. Quote, in 1955, the average weight of chickens sold in market was 3.07 pounds, while the number for the first half of 2016 was 6.81 pounds, according to the National Chicken Council. These chronically obese birds suffer joint issues, heart attacks, and are frequently unable to walk by the time they're eight weeks old. Chickens and other birds are not protected under the Human Methods of Slaughter Act, which grants minimal protections in transport and slaughter for most animals. It's common for hundreds of thousands of chickens to be kept in an industrial barn, like we can see here, but unfortunately, the chickens raised in industrial farming are the only ones still trapped. On this slide, we see Craig Watts, who used to be a poultry producer for Purdue. Once a farmer enters the chicken business, it's almost financially impossible to leave. This industry is run by a handful of mega corporations, so most new farmers sign a contract to work under one of these. Uh, when I say mega corporations, I mean that a handful of large companies, maybe three or four, do most of the chicken businesses for the entire United States. So it really is a monopolized market. Before the chicken farmers begin contract growing, which is what it's called when they grow under one of these giants, they must build at least one chicken house, which costs $300,000. So about the cost of the house, maybe some of you are thinking, that, that's, that's how much a night house costs. Um, now imagine that most chicken farmers have four of these houses. The farmer's massive investment has gained them some incredibly specialized infrastructure, but it's left them massively indebted to their parent company because now they're in a hole with this specialized equipment that they can't use for anything else. So it's very hard to get out of the business. Craig Watts, who we can see here on the screen, said that there's a sense of hopelessness among farmers. Half a million dollars worth of debt makes a man very agreeable. End quote. Even if a farmer has concerns about the well being of the animals on their own farm, they receive much needed bonuses for how many chickens they grow. So, allowing the chickens more space or exercise will diminish their income. Farmers don't technically own the chickens on their property and could be criminally prosecuted or intimidated for making changes. A hundred years ago, most farmers grew many crops and several different species of animals. These farms were healthier ecosystems because they looked like the ones we talked about earlier. There were species that were able to interact with each other and with their own habitats. Next, we're going to talk about cattle. Oh, that they so cute. This is a picture of a rescued cow named Prince. And this is my great telling us this. Um, I'm very excited for the day where I can roll out of bed and go outside and get some cow kisses. Yes, the cows are my absolute favorite. And they're some of the best mothers in the animal kingdom. They're pregnant for nine months, and then they give birth to one or rarely two cows. Mother cows bond with their calves through nursing and through grooming. And though her newborn calf weighs up to 90 pounds at birth, her body produces all the sustenance it needs to grow. Cow's milk, like that of most other mammals, or all other mammals, is rich in fat, protein, and sugar, so that her baby can be made fast. This ensures that the calves grow rapidly and are fast enough to escape predators and survive strong winter temperatures. When the calf is in his mother's womb, he becomes acquainted to her voice. Mother and baby cattle almost immediately recognize each other's voices. Since cattle are herd animals, this identification is important so they don't lose one another. To a calf, their mother is their world. She protects, cleans, and nourishes her baby. The calf's natural lifespan is 15 to 20 years. Since 1975, mothers in the dairy industry have been bred to produce 2.5 times as much milk. As you can see in these pictures, this is reflected in other slides. And I think that it's very interesting that when, oftentimes when people sketch a cow, the first thing that they draw is the other. And if you think about a little beast or a wild goat or a dog even, others are very minimal and they're hidden. And this is so that the mother can get around. But this increase in other size since 1975, and then even a little bit before, 
um, creates frequent infection and makes walking difficult. For dairy production, the calves must be taken from their mother because even though there's an excess of milk, um, this milk is to be sold to human customers. So after a mother cow has labored, she's often too tired to fight to keep her baby and he is more easily taken away. Ranchers report that this separation is done early to prevent bonding. Conveniently, a labor mother cannot defend her calf as well. And when they are separated, female calves may be raised to replace their mothers in the herd. And they are often fed soy milk or another milk replacer because their own milk, which was intended for them, is being fed to humans. So that's a little silly. Uh, male calves and unwanted females will be raised for beef, but more often the calves are killed for their meal when they are five months old. Many newborn calves are killed on the farm when they're born and discarded because their only purpose was to make their mother lactate. Next we're going to talk about sea life. With most of the Earth's surface covered with water, fish have plenty of habitat to swim. The ocean is home to the majority of life on Earth. Fish, dolphins, sharks, whales, and a myriad of other creatures spend their lives at sea. Eating fish was a staple of biblical times, and it's referenced often in the Bible. Jesus himself ate a piece of brother's fish to prove his risen body was not a ghost. Yet in biblical times, fishers were much less quote unquote successful in their fishing. Jesus performed a miracle where the disciples caught a miraculous number of fish when they caught 153 fish. This number in the area in the era of industrial fishing is child's play. We are literally running out of fish. Quote, according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, 90% of the world's fish stocks are currently overused or completely exhausted. End quote. To understand the health of fisheries, ecologists calculate a catch per unit of effort with the amount of effort and resources it takes to catch a fish. Fishing boats today only catch about 20%, 20% of the fish for the same amount of effort as boats did in 1950. So just about 70 years ago, we were catching 80% more fish for the same amount of effort as we are now. Part of the reason for this drastic decline is due to bycatch for catching of unwanted species. The World Wildlife Fund estimates that nearly half of the world's recorded fish catch is unused, wasted, or not accounted for. Some of you would be familiar with the environmental impact of removing the bulls from Yellowstone. And it has a really happy ending because we're able to bring wolves back into Yellowstone and support that ecosystem again. Um, we brought them from Canada, so shout out Canada. And now I'd be happy to talk about this story over lunch, but it serves as a reminder that we cannot simply remove species from an ecosystem and not anticipate the consequences. Uh, that's very similar to what we're doing with sharks in the ocean. And when we remove those wolves versus when we put them back, the river systems recover and um, there were changes in tree life near the rivers, um, changes in prey populations, obviously. And it's so interesting how one species um, impacts an ecosystem so much and has so much to do with the health of that ecosystem. So as you can see at the top of this slide, this is called an, an energy pyramid. And we're going to talk about stewardship. So earlier we discussed how the sun is the source of energy for life on our planet. And on the side here, we can see the sun energy coming in. Now at the bottom of this pyramid, you can see these green plants, and these are called producers. So these would be something like wheat or trees or um, maybe corn. Then on top of those, there's primary consumers. So these are pictured here as rabbits. Above them, secondary consumers as snakes. And above them, tertiary consumers, which are represented today by a hawk. So as you can see, this is a pyramid. At the bottom, it's very broad, and it goes into a narrow point. And the reason for this is because 90% of energy is lost from one level the next as we rise, and it's lost as heat. So as the sun comes in, we have that 100% energy that we're starting with, and as we go up, 10% of it continues to the rabbits, 10% of that 10% to the snakes, 10% of that 10% of that 10% to the hawks. So this is because um, we cannot support so many hawks on the landscape because there's just not enough energy to do it. 
Plants can use sunlight directly for energy. Animals must eat plants for energy. And other animals eat animals that eat plants that eat some for energy. The more steps there are in this process, the more energy is lost in each step. So both animals and plants need room to grow and live, and the more steps we climb, the more space we need to produce the same amount of calories. The landscape simply cannot support consumers eating at the top of the pyramid because it takes so much space in order to feed them. We notice in nature that predators are much rarer than my primary consumers. There are thousands of wildebeest per lion on the safari, many more deer than wolves, and many more mice than hawks. It's estimated that 80% of farmland is used to produce livestock, who only supply 20% of the world's calories. So, what are some ways that we can bring redemption to our eating? We're going to talk a little bit about um, how we can be the rabbits in this system. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have to eat rabbit food, as you'll find out later. So, one of the solutions to this would be farm to animal products. So, this is a picture of Hannibal. Hannibal the cow. He was rescued in September 21, uh, 2021, right before my birthday. And it was very, it felt so special because I was following this like it was, um, like it was a trial. Uh, just watching for two months and this cow walked in his freedom and was running around in the woods. Um, and then was finally rescued by Skydance Animal Sanctuary. And he's just the most beautiful boy. He's just so gorgeous. And I really hope that I can meet him someday. But one of the ways that we can uh, bring redemption to our eating and be respectful of, of those like Hannibal is if we're going to buy animal products, we should purchase them from small farms where the animals' lives look similar to how they would if they were free. Small is important, though it's not a silver bullet, because farming animals at a large scale almost always prevents property. Just imagine for a sec if you could offer the charity offer. Um, to your pet, if you had one dog, or six dogs, or 75 dogs, or 230,000, be willing to pay higher prices for welfare. If you want eggs, maybe consider keeping chickens or ducks in your own backyard. Let's be aware of coded language like cage free, natural, humane slaughter, local, and those with close shot images of green grass pastures or of smiling cartoon animals. Local, organic, and daily rates do not reflect meaningful improvements in animal welfare. Question what farmers tell you. Quote, oh, babies are separ separated so their mothers don't step on them. Okay, but why don't their mothers have enough room to not step on them? Let's question financial incentives when the farmers tell you that animals are happier indoors, in cages, alone, separated from family, or in conditions otherwise different from the ones that have them. Research slaughter practices. How are the animals you eat dying? Are you comfortable with these techniques? Why or why not? Ask yourself, am I paying someone to do something I'm uncomfortable with? Question, who works at my slaughterhouse? And do they have the choice to do this job? The benefit of hunting and fishing is that the animals live a natural free life largely undedicated by another species. We should aim for a quick death and we should recognize that death is not painless, nor does the animal want to die. The benefit of this system in my mind is that the animal does not learn to trust and depend on you before you kill them. Support the hunting and fishing rights of indigenous people who have sustainably harvested for millennia and learned from them. I follow a plant-based style, lifestyle, and this is a lifestyle that almost eliminates animal suffering. I need to do a better job of going to the farmer's market this year and getting more organic products and those farmers with mostly hand tools that protect insects, mice, and birds who balance each other's populations. They help support soil health and they prevent excessive weed threats so that we don't have to use chemicals. Buying from farms with a healthier ecosystem submits to the cycles which God set up in nature, especially they respect cow's creatures. The ability to adjust food habits is more accessible for some communities than others. Many of us in this country do not have access to fresh food because it is too far away or too expensive. Those of us who, like myself, are blessed to have transportation to a grocery store and the means to purchase fresh food should aim to remove barriers from others rather than pretending that any lifestyle change is, excuse me, equally accessible to everyone. 
Leaving animal products off your plate is not a silver bullet to an ethical lifestyle, but it is a great step. Try to buy local, when possible, and bonus points if you bring your own. Research shows that people who are treated, research how people are treated in certain produce industries try to avoid plastic. Explore studies on the links between plant-based eating and lower risk of heart disease and cancer. Earlier, we talked about what a good creation looks like. Minister Randy Woodley encourages Christians to pursue shalom on earth. Woodley writes that shalom can be defined as fullness, health, peace, welfare, safety, and soundness. God's design for and delight and diversity are embedded in the creation narratives, which describe order, relationships, stewardship, beauty, and rhythm as the essential foundations for shalom, the way God designed the universe to be. There is much joy in participating in the shalom for which God intended this world, a chance to participate in the grace that saved us. Let's practice what we preach with our eating. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate you coming out today. I was telling my mom last week that I thought only two people would come, so I really appreciate you being here. Um, these are my references, which I would be happy to share with anyone. And here's some food that I've been eating in the last year. Some falafel, we got some pancakes from Anna's house, super delicious. Um, I made uh, peanut stew here. Got some vegan sushi, some pizza. My wok pan is not even big enough to make my veggies that I tried to put in it that one time, but I'm figuring it out. <laughs> uh, I love pizza, so you'll see that I'm sure you want. This is some chana masala. A little bit of birthday cake. This is what I have for Thanksgiving, which was really delicious. And some Christmas cookies because, of course. And these are some some sources that I'm not going to display downstairs. I'm not going to hook up the PowerPoint. So I invite you to take a picture of these while they're up. Um, some of my favorites on here are written by Andy Whitley, who I talked about earlier. And there's also a great documentary called The Invisible Vegan that talks about some of those differences in access to uh, making some lifestyle diet changes um, for different communities. Some of my favorite documentaries in this list include 73 Cows, so cute, they're beautiful. Um, the Biggest Little Farm is a neat perspective on what creation could look like, though it is a little bit utopic. I will definitely want to do that. <laughs> Um, and they Bell story. If you wanted to cry, I always cry on a Bell story on YouTube. Um, yes. So I would like to thank Creature Time for hosting my fellowship this year and for helping me to learn about different communities that are affected by animal agriculture, not just animal, but also human communities. And yes, I, I thank them for their support and for exposing some of these things. And I'm really grateful that I was able to talk to you all today. So thank you.